I often regretted, back in the dark times, that I failed to write the true story of my youth, if I had, it might have saved lives. Either that or gotten me killed. Because, as I explain, I was almost certainly the luckiest man ever born. And that kind of luck, when exposed, either drew people to learn from it or drove them to crucify it. Whatever your first image for the luckiest man might be, health, money, talent, friends, I probably matched it, save that I was never dropped dead handsome. And that was lucky too. I had friends who were that good looking, and it wasn't a blessing to them. Some people envied them, many hated them, the wrong ones pursued them, and if they weren't careful their looks would take over their lives. You can hide being smart when people start to hate you for it, but you can't very well hide your face. The part of my luck that mattered most, however, was being blessed with clarity. Now, since that concept may be new to you, I'll ask you to try this. Imagine going back in time to the day you were born, just as you are right now. Imagine living through those years a second time, knowing in advance when all the wars and scandals would start and knowing how they'd end up. How much easier might that be? If you're able to imagine that, you'll start to understand my luck, that's what I had. I didn't know every little thing that would happen, of course, but I knew the directions, the driving forces and the end states. I saw bloody images and alarming headlines. In short, and it would be hard to overemphasize the importance of this, I experienced far less fear than other people. So, a constantly healthy body and an exceptional mind were tremendous gifts, for which I am deeply grateful, but they were second to the blessing of clarity. That clarity is also why, by what seemed unanimous consent, I was given the job of writing these stories. My view of these events was unobstructed. Even the people whose lives we will follow in these accounts had perspectives that were colored by traumas. I was far less traumatized, and thus my view was clearer. Aside from genetics, my luck began with my grandfather, who was, as they used to say, a bucky junkie. By that I mean that he followed Buckminster Fuller everywhere he could, made precise notes, and reworked his concepts. Through the 1970s living in Los Angeles, he published a monthly newsletter devoted to such things. He never made a great deal of money from it, but it led him to my grandmother, paid their bills, and allowed them to grow and expand, rather than sweating away their time working for money alone. In a strange way, it was good for grandfather, and thus good for me. When Bucky died in July of 1983, it released him from inertia. He had spent two decades of his life gathering and coordinating knowledge, and it was high time for him to start using it. He had already collected Bucky's best and there wasn't much more to get, especially since independent thought was all but dried up by then. Grandfather and Bucky had an odd relationship. Grandfather greatly appreciated Fuller's work, but he disapproved of Bucky's drinking and whoremongering, and especially that he would recount those stories, not caring that his wife would be confronted with them. Fuller was aware of this, he had given grandfather several interviews, during which the subject came up, but to his credit, this made Bucky trust grandfather in a peculiar way. You're the one who calls me out when I head toward the rocks, he once said, with what seemed to be honest appreciation. And so, in November of 1983, grandfather, grandmother, and their teenage children, my mother and my aunts, ran away to Alaska, leaving the mainline American culture. By then it was clear that the surge of thinking that lasted from 1965 to 1975 was gone. From then on, they knew, there would be a slow reversion to conformity. Only after another cycle of obedience had rung itself out could there be another cycle of thinking. What really made the choice for grandfather was the job he took some months earlier, in July of 83, a job he was given by a fellow admirer of Bucky's. Grandfather began working for the Los Angeles Times, as their New York correspondent. That made life complicated for the family, but it was the best choice available to them, and they needed the money. So, Grandfather stayed in Manhattan two weeks on and one week off. There, 
immersed in the news culture and with friends in high places, he saw the purposeful dismantling of the independent thinking that had once sustained his newsletter. He told a story of being at a private meeting with high and mighties from the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations, who directed media moguls to promote neutral outlets for the moral energies of the populace. They suggested harmless causes, which they said involve animals, vegetables, and minerals, and told the moguls to leave dealing with people in the hands of the state. Given the power of these foundations and given that the moguls needed loans from the banks they controlled, Grandfather believed that they would succeed, that they would drain away whatever passion remained from the open-minded years. Seeing that the establishment was fighting back and would win, Grandfather took freelance work, in addition to his work for the Times, and saved up travel money. Before long, he gave his notice at the paper, and the whole family clambered into an airplane destined for Anchorage. And their grandfather started over, knowing everything that Bucky knew, or at least the important things. And once there, he began putting those ideas to use. I grew up surrounded by good people full of purpose. Grandfather, from his first year in Alaska, sent an annual letter to all his past subscribers, mostly on the development of world systems in the light of Bucky's ideas. But he also encouraged them to come to Alaska and visit. And so, one by one and two by two, many came and many stayed. We were an informal community scattered through the smaller towns north of Anchorage, Palmer, Wasilla, Houston, Fishhook, and Butte. In general, these people weren't far short of wonderful. And their children, with a few exceptions, carried most of their better qualities. As a result, I matured with a very clear and wide view of the world, a view that made the broadcast fears trivial. It was for this reason that I used to love the episodes of Star Trek where Kirk and Spock went on away missions to old Earth or to planets that very much resembled Earth. The way they thought about the events of those worlds, passing ephemera that the locals, sadly, took seriously, was precisely how I saw the world. I must have watched those few episodes a hundred times each. The one world event that mattered to our group, at least the only one I can recall from my childhood, was the rise of the internet. I remember everyone being deeply engaged in that for some years until it became clear that the internet had become a worldwide surveillance network. That was when they began preparing for the worst, creating rituals that would help people survive in conditions that they said would combine the worst of Orwell and Huxley. The adults were wise to have us children design our survival rituals. Even though the adults were quite detached from the wider world, their thoughts were still complicated by it. Ours were simpler and less affected, which is a better mindset for creating rituals. It didn't take as long to latch onto the arcane terminology of the Catholic churches. We especially liked the mystery of and the assumption of in rapid succession, we came up with the assumption of Eve, the assumption of love, the assumption of surpassing, the mystery of two moralities, the mystery of the two natures, and the mystery of the gaps. In less than a year, we had all of these defined, including words to be spoken and objects to be exchanged. A year later, this time at the suggestion of the adults, we created one last ritual, the mystery of consciousness. We had great fun teaching our rituals to all the people we knew. And then we were even more excited when the adults arranged for us, or at least those of us who were old enough, to travel around the world teaching our rituals to like-minded groups. But I shouldn't give you the impression that most of my time was spent traveling. It wasn't. Rather, most of father's time, my brother Aaron's time, and my own were spent in our businesses. At various times, we ran air delivery services, critical for Alaska, especially in the winter, supply services for cruise ships, and our equipment maintenance business, not to mention many active investments. At the same time, we kept the interchange active between homeschoolers, bitcoiners, voluntarists, agorists, hackers, makers, and a variety of others. It was toward the end of that period when we began to refer to each other, in a bit of dark humor, as the surviving souls, which soon enough became the sole survivors. Then, 
however it is that such things happen, people began calling us the cult of the soul survivors. Then soul was misinterpreted as soul, which made us sound like some kind of death cult. And so we landed on a list of terrorist groups, even though none of the enforcers knew anything about us. They probably just needed to fill out their lists. We stopped using surviving souls once we were designated as domestic terrorists, though we did sometimes use a symbol incorporating the letters CSS, simply to express defiance. We were amazed to see that the enforcers devoted military-level budgets to keeping the world safe from us. I have to think that all or most of the money was diverted into the pockets of high officials, since we saw nothing of them for a long time. But for the moment that's enough about me. I will proceed to the stories I was appointed to bring you. Feynman Robeson, Year 210 Post Dawn This was an audiobook teaser of the introductory chapter of The Breaking Dawn, another amazing piece of freedom fiction by legendary cypherpunk, Paul Rosenberg. To order this book along with A Lodging of Wayfaring Men, his other classic fiction work, just visit libertyunderattack.com slash Paul. Again, libertyunderattack.com slash Paul. And while you're there, make sure to check out our full selection of books, bundles, privacy tools, ghost phones and ghost pads, apothecary items, Pasnia Farms canned goods, and more on the way. Liberty Under Attack Publications, share your story. Find your freedom.